This is FRM Part 1, Book 2, Quantitative Analysis, and this is Chapter 1, Probabilities. Now remember, as good financial risk managers, what we're trying to do is identify the risks and quantify the risks and then manage the risks. And so this first chapter called Probabilities sounds an awful lot like something that we should be doing, that we should be considering in, inside of those, those three tasks. Remember how we define risk. Risk can be defined as, as uncertainty, as variabilities in outcomes and, and in terms of probabilities. And so that's really what we're trying to do in book two. And please note that book two is much more quantitative, thus the name of it. And so we're gonna be technical. And although we're gonna be using the, fi the financial calculator and our regular calculator a good bit, lots of the challenges are going to be taking some mathematical background and applying it into our risk management principles that we talked about back in book one. Let's look at the learning objectives of this chapter. Uh, notice that there are lots of action words describe and distinguish and define, and then there's one or two calculate. So we're going to look at continuous and discrete random variables. We're going to look at the PDF. We're going to look at the CDF and we're going to look at the IDF as well. We're going to calculate the probability of an event given a discrete probability function. And we're going to look at independent uh, events and mutually exclusive events, joint probabilities and conditional probabilities. So let's get to it with the basic definition. What is a random variable? A variable whose possible values are outcomes of a random phenomenon. So of course the classic examples sound something like this. You flip a coin, it could be heads or it could be tails. I mean, you only have two choices, so there's a 50% chance, but that's random over time, meaning that you can't predict whether the next flip is going to be a head or a tail. And I'm always fascinated, and it's been years since I've been to Atlantic City uh, on, the, uh, on the gambling floor, but I was fascinated by the roulette table where they have, uh, they have an electronic sign that keeps track of whether it was a, uh, a, a black or a red black or red and so gamblers are looking at that you know and if it says black 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 then they use that to try to predict what what that next outcome is going to be but it's called a random variable because you just can't quite do it throwing the dice is another example of course there are only six possibilities there but the chance and we'll see this in a future slide the chance of throwing a one or a two or any of the numbers is one sixth, right? Because there are only six possibilities, but they are random, meaning that you cannot predict. Although those of you who watch movies, you know, I like to give uh, movie examples. And one of those James Bond movies, he was playing with a bad guy who could, uh, who could always roll a double six in backgammon. And then the final example, claims on an insurance policy. Of course, you can't predict when you're going to wreck your car or get sick or death. Now, there are two different types of random variables. So their first one, the simplest one, are discrete random variables. And so just, just remember these, that they're discrete. They, they follow a range of all possible values in, in a finite set, like our like our coin, which had two, right? And our, uh, our dice, which had six sides. And so the interesting part of this is that <clears throat> the possible values, <clears throat> excuse me, the possible values are countable. And I have an example there, picking a stock from the S&P 500 index. Let me go ahead and ask you guys a trick question. How many, how many stocks are in the S&P 500 index? And the answer is, is 500. So what is the, these are random variables if you just if you just randomly select one maybe with the first letter or the length of the name or what industry the, so it, they're just going to come out randomly. Now I asked you that question because I want to follow that up with how many stocks are there in the Wilshire 5000? You might be tempted to say 5000, but about 20 years ago there were over 7000 stocks in the Wilshire 5000 and today there's maybe 3600 or so. Uh, nevertheless, regardless of how many are in the index, it's still, it's still a random variable. 
So let's take a look at something called the probability mass function. And this, this definition is not, it's not inside the chapter, but I wanted to show you this because uh, we're, we're looking at probabilities of each possible outcome. So when we roll the dice, the probability that the outcome is going to be a one is one over six. The probability is going to be a two or a three or a four down, down the left hand column. It, it has to be one sixth. So this thing is called a probability mass function and you can see it on the graph there where you have one through six on the horizontal axis and then the uh, probability of each outcome is fixed at one at one sixth. So this is called a probability mass function. We're going to call it something different when we look at a continuous random variable. But I wanted to give you this just so you kind of get a sense of what the picture kind of looks like when we do some continuous variables. Now the cumulative distribution function is exactly what the name suggests. It's cumulating all of the possibilities. And so what's the probability that you roll a one and that that's one six? What's the probability that you roll a two or a one? Well, that's two out of six possibilities. What's the probability that you roll a three or a two or a one? Well, that's three six. And so you cumulate, they cumulate those things as you go from the first roll, uh, I'm sorry, from the first possibility out to the sixth possibility. And then up the vertical axis, that has to sum to 100%, right? So cumulative distribution function, and this can be applied to a, a discrete random variable as it is in this picture. But that's very different from a continuous random variable, which can take any value along a given interval of a number line. So back here, let me just do this right here. Uh, when you roll the dice, you can't roll a 1.5 or a 2.73 or a 4.6284395, right? So you could just do a one and a two. So you're discreetly fixed, but a continuous random variable can take any value along, uh, along an interval. And classic examples include things like time and temperature and measurements like uh, like height and weight. You know, for example, you could say, how long does it take you to get from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? And uh, the answer depends on things like traffic. The answer depends on things like weather. The answer depends on things like mode of transportation. I mean, clearly if you walk, it's gonna take you a little, at least a little bit longer than if you fly. Uh, so, so continuous random variables, they, they can take you know, almost any value along a number line. And then financial examples include the realized return on a financial security. You know, like what can you do? You can, you can buy a share of stock today, let's say for $100, and what's the worst thing that can happen? You can lose all your money. Let's say there's no leverage inside of the portfolio. So the most you can lose is 100%. The most you can gain is, boy, can I say a positive infinity percent? Although that really doesn't make any sense from a practical standpoint. But you get a sense that you, know, you, can, you can lose 42.89%. You can gain 2.6347%. So this is a continuous random variable. And then another good example is the variability in returns of a portfolio. We'll, we'll talk at length about that in a future chapter. And so this is what the relationship looks like formally, that uh, P is the likelihood that some uh, continuous random variable X will fall between two numbers, R1 and R2. And of course, R2 is greater than R1. All right, remember a few slides ago, I gave you that probability mass function, which applies to the discrete distributions, but it's called a probability density function when it applies to random variables that are continuous. And so the question is still the same. What we're trying to do is given a probability density function, we're trying to determine the probability that X is going to fall between two other numbers. A and B, and of course, of course, B is going to be greater than A. And so look at that bell-shaped curve that I have at the bottom of the picture. So down along the horizontal axis is just a bunch of numbers, whatever that is. Maybe it's the return on a share of stock. And then the function goes over on the 
vertical axis. And so let's, let's take an example here. Let's suppose that A is the mean and the mean return on this share of stock is 8.04563%. What's the probability that you're going to generate a return of exactly that 8.0254% or whatever number that I just came up with a minute ago? And the answer is close to zero, probably zero, essentially zero to get that exact and specific number. Same thing with B, you know, suppose you want to know what's the probability of earning 10.329746%. Uh, I mean, clearly the probability is so small to be close to zero. But that's not what we're doing here with the probability density function. What we're trying to do is figure out the probability between those two numbers. And that's really, really cool. So if you look at that shaded area there, that's what's happening with the probability density function for a continuous variable. So we can say that the probability of earning between, boy, what were those two numbers I made up? You know, 8.0245 and 10.64321, whatever that numbers are, we can, we can figure out what that probability is. So this is all part of, what do we do? We identified the risk. Now this is part of quantifying the risk. We can get that probability. If we have a client that comes to us and says, look, here's my portfolio. I need you to invest so that I earn between, what were those two numbers? Eight something and 10 something. And you can say, all right, if we invest in this portfolio, there's a 72% chance that you're gonna earn between those two numbers. And then you can say to the client, are you confident? Are you comfortable? Are you okay with those range of outcomes? Then the client will say either yes or no. And then you, you go from there in terms of managing the risk. Now the cumulative distribution function is exactly what we did with that little step up ladder with the rolls of the dice where we went from one six to two six all, all the way out to um, all the way out to 6.6. Six. But this formation here is for the continuous random variable. And so we still have A and B, two possible values of X with B greater than A. And we're trying to determine the probability that X lies between A and B. And typically the starting point for the cumulative distribution function is all the way on the left. And so then you, you move to the right and you move to the right until you get to the point where you stop. And then you compute that probability and you can say something like, oh, your portfolio has a 12% chance of losing a minimum of $10 million or $5 million or whatever that is. Now let's take a look at the difference between the PDF and the CDF. And so here that first bullet point is what I was talking about. There's, there's a zero CDF at the minimum value of the PDF. And it doesn't have to be zero for the CDF, but a lot of times, a lot of times it is. Most of the time it is. And so since we're talking about continuous random variables, of course we have to talk about calculus. And so there's the relationship that is a, uh, that is a first derivative. And so the PDF is just the first derivative of the CDF. Now here's how I want you to think about this and then what we're gonna do in the next slide. When we do this cumulative distribution function or sometimes people call it the cumulative density function, this is the question that we're asking. We're asking what is the probability that corresponds to a known z-score? So this is kind of like the traditional stuff that you did back in your first or second statistics class. You had an idea or a sense about the population of something, you know, some some random variable, whether it was the number of the number of rocks in your street after the after the trucks come around and, uh, you know, put that down during a snowstorm or number of clouds in the sky or stock returns. All right. So you have you have all those things and you say, you know, I think there's a million rocks out there, but then you take a sample and you th say, oh, you know, maybe there's only 900,000. So you do the difference between the population mean and the sample mean, and then you divide by the standard deviation to get that Z score. So then you look that up on the table and you, and you find that probability. Okay, so that's kind of like a traditional uh, statistics model. But this IDF, which we're gonna talk about just a little bit in the next slide, this asks the opposite question. It says, 
suppose that you know the probability. Suppose that you know exactly the probability of finding 900,000 rocks out in your street and you want to know what that z-score is. What is the corresponding z-score? That's why that i stands for inverse and so it's the inverse function. And so here's one, one part of those learning objectives is to describe this inverse cumulative distribution function. And so there it is, f to the minus one, it's the inverse of the CDF. And so there's, the, um, there's that probability, which is known, right? Let's go back to this one here. For the inverse function, you know the probability, so you know that p, and you wanna know what the z-score is. You know, the interesting about, thing about this is that there are lots of distributions that have inverses, but, but lots that do not. So this can't be applied universally across all distributions. But, but some distributions that have the inverse function, then you can use this kind of as a shortcut if you need to, or if you have different information available at the beginning of the test. All right, how about mutually exclusive events? There's a good one here about, about the, turning a car right or left, but let me give you a great example that I give in all of my corporate finance lectures. Let's suppose that you are the owner of a golf course and your golf course is brown. You have no, there's no greenness on your golf course. And it's because, you know, for some reason, it just doesn't rain on your golf course. So you think, all right, I need a sprinkler system. So you, so you call a plumber and you say to the plumber, come out, and tell me what you can do about the golf course. And the plumber comes out and says, oh, I'm gonna put pipes here and there and all sorts of stuff. And so you calculate the net present value and it turns out to be positive. But those of you who are homeowners know, you know that if you have a plumber out to your house and the plumber says, I'll charge you $600 to fix this, you're going to call another plumber. You're gonna get a second opinion. So you're gonna do the same thing with the golf course. So you call another plumber and he or she comes out and they say, oh, we're going to do pipes, we're going to do whatever. So you calculate the net present value and both of the net present values for both plumbers are positive. Do you need both plumbers? And the answer is no. And this is a, my great description of a mutually exclusive event. When you pick plumber A, you're automatically excluding plumber B. So what do I have in that first bullet point? They're mutually exclusive if the occurrence of A rules out the occurrence of B. And so, of course, when you're driving a car, you can't turn right and left at the same time. All right, so uh, you have randomly, let's just say you don't know where you're going, so you just randomly turn left, randomly turn right. That's been a fun experience with two of my four children who are old enough to drive. They have no idea where they're going at any time. All right, the probability of any two mutually exclusive events occurring is just the sum of the probabilities. And so there we have, you know, the A and the union of B is those two probabilities. Now, how about independent events? This is kind of like the opposite, kind of like the reciprocal of mutually exclusive events. This means that you're evaluating one particular event on its own, on its own merits and and the, the decision to invest in one particular project or choose one particular outcome does not influence the accept or reject decision of any other outcome. How about, how about an example with weather and the stock market? So two random variables, right? The day's weather, however you measure it with temperature. I think we had that up in an earlier slide. And then the returns on the stock market. What do we know about stock market returns? I bet you guys have heard the term a random walk down Wall Street. So stock prices or stock returns, they might follow a random walk, which means that you really have no idea what's going to happen. But let's suppose that we wanted to figure out what the probability that stock prices will fall and that rain will also fall. Ah, so here we go, we gotta do this. So tomorrow, the first variable is weather, that it's gonna rain. The second variable is the stock market, that it's gonna fall. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the probability of the raining and the probability of a stock market crash, or maybe not a crash, but just a decline, and we're gonna multiply that, okay? Joint probability is the likelihood that it will rain, and at the same time, the markets will be down. Uh, 
this is probably a fun study to do. I'm not sure that in our risk management model that this might have anything to do with anything that we're doing. Although there's probably some relationship between, let's take an example of, let's suppose that we have a client who is a farmer and it rains on one day. That's probably not going to be too big of a deal, but suppose it rains for a month. Well, then stock prices of that farming company will probably fall. Uh, how about a probability matrix? So we're looking at um, joint probabilities of two variables. So let, let's suppose that we have a corporation that has issued shares of stock and bonds to finance the purchase of those positive net present value projects. And let's decide that with the stock, there are two possibilities. The stock could either outperform a benchmark, maybe like the S&P 500 index, or underperform the benchmark. So it could either be more or less. That makes perfect sense. Now with the bond, let's suppose that we have three possible outcomes. Now remember that these corporate bonds and other kinds of bonds as well are graded. They are rated by these ratings agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor 500 and Fitch. And so what these rating agencies do is they either, uh, they almost always have no change, but sometimes there's an upgrade and sometimes there's a downgrade. So we have three possible outcomes with the bond and two possible outcomes with the share of stock. All right. And so those joint probabilities inside of that matrix then are the probabilities that let's do the first one there, that the stock outperforms and that the bond is upgraded. That's 17%. And then in the little cloud over there, I've got the example for uh, outperforms and, and downgrade. That's 6%. All right, so there's a probability matrix. And then what we need to do in the next slide is we need to do some adding. Of course, we need to do some adding because what do we know? We know that the stock is either going to outperform or underperform. We know the bond is either going to be upgraded, downgraded, or, or have no change. All right, so if we sum the columns downward, we get a 52% chance that the stock is going to outperform, 48% chance that the stock is going to underperform. And if you sum those, of course, you get 100. And then we have a 22% chance of an upgrade, a no change, a 53%, and a downgrade, 25%. So, of course, those have to sum to 100. So think about, think about these uh, joint probabilities inside of the matrix. And then, of course, they have to sum to 100. How about conditional probabilities? This is a probability in which um, the, the likelihood of one event occurring has some relationship, either positive or negative, to one or more um, other events. You know, like for example, when, you know, 20, how long has it been? 28 years ago when I got married, my wife and I said, you know what? We love each other. We're going to get married. And boy, oh boy, we sure hope that, uh, that we're going to have children. And then, so we get married and we have children. And then one day, 15 years ago, we had an egg split. So I've got these 14 year old twins. And so what this, what does this mean? That there's a probability that we were going to have twins based on previous children, based on our jobs and our income levels, or based on the fact that we got married, or based on the fact that we actually even ever met. You know, I'm from one state and my wife is from another state way, way far away. You know, so sooner or later, sooner or later, these events are going to have a relationship to each other. All right. So what does that have to do with economics here? Let's take an example. Let's suppose that we're thinking about um, the GDP. So the, remember, GDP measures the size of the economy, right? So what we're, what we're hoping to do as an investor is if the economy rises, if the economy expands, well, then that increases the probability that the stocks that we own will be able to buy low and sell high. So let's suppose we come up with a 40% chance that GDP will rise, which means there's a 60% chance that it'll either stay the same or fall. Event B is that interest rates will rise. Now, 
if interest rates rise, what that does is it will tend to make our stock investments and our bond investments less valuable. It will tend to, but it depends on a bunch of other stuff. And let's suppose there's a 50% chance that this will occur. So the question then becomes, what is the relationship between gross domestic product and interest rates? You know, does one cause the other? Does there, is there some correlation between those two? But clearly, as an economist, you would look at the relationship with GDP and interest rates and you would think there's probably some relationship there. All right, so a conditional probability is going to look at these two events in relationship to each other. So that what we're going to do is ask the question, what is the probability that there will be GDP growth, which, like I said, has a 40% chance, given, given the 50% chance that interest rates are going to rise? And here's the good formula for computing conditional probability, and it's relatively simple. Let's, let's do an example here. So we have 100 investors. Some of them buy stock. Some of them buy bonds. Some of them buy both stocks and bonds, and then some of them buy something else. All right, if an investor is chosen at random who bought the bonds, what is the probability that they also bought the stock? So what you're tempted to say is, oh, 20 out of 100 purchased stocks and bonds. But what we're doing here is that we're going on this conditional probability assumption is that they have already bought the bonds. What is the probability of them buying stocks? And so I have the solution there in the matrix. And so all we're going to do is take the... Uh, the 20%, which was kind of like the temptation answer, what I said earlier, and we're going to divide that by those that bought bonds. So that gets us to 67%. And here's a good summary table of some of these formulas that I've had in the slide deck. It's probably a wise decision for you guys to work through some examples and to try to memorize those. And that takes us through chapter one. And I think we covered all of those learning objectives. Next up is going to be basic statistics, where we're going to talk about fun things like the mean and the standard deviation.